All right, now I'd like to introduce you to, and my deepest apologies for mispronunciation of some of these words. Uh, Tamark Solomon is committed to the better part of the iwi, of the katahai tangha, of the all Maori, the wider well-being of all peoples. He is a strong advocate for the Maori economy and was instrumental in setting up the iwi chairs forum of 2005. He, was, he is the elected council of Kafahakara, sorry about that, Nahatu, since 1998 and is the current chair. He was recognized in 2013 Queen's New Year's Honors with a Knight Companion to the New Zealand Order of Merit of Service to the Maori in Business. Ladies and gentlemen, Ta Mark Solomon. My first greeting is to you, the distinguished guests from around the world. My second greeting is to the, the people of the land of Australia, the Aboriginal. And to you all, I bring the greetings of Neitahu, Whanui. Thank you for the invitation to speak to this, the inaugural World Indigenous Network Conference 2013. It is a pleasure to be here today. It is a wonderful to see so many people representing many different countries and cultures to support the launch of this World Indigenous Network. When I was invited to speak to the conference, I was told the aims of the network were to promote and achieve better conservation of biological diversity and sustainable use of our val valuable natural resources. These are objectives that my iwi, my tribe in New Zealand, strive to obtain on a daily basis, and it's what we call kaitiakitanga. The network also seeks to improve social cohesion as well as increased economic opportunities with the aim of alleviating poverty among indigenous communities. So all of these are goals and objectives that we in New Zealand are working to achieve as well, and they are strong reasons to accept your invitation to be here today. Today I'm going to address the topic of indigenous rights within New Zealand's national parks and try to answer how far have we really come. But first it is necessary that I provide context for you and tell you a little bit about where we began our journey so that you can see what it is we have been striving for and why that is important to us. Ngai Tahu means the people of Tahu, and all Ngai Tahu Whanui can trace their ancestry back to one man, the tribe's founder, Tahu Potiki, who was born 22 generations ago. Our tribal area encompasses most of the South Island of New Zealand and Stewart Island, or as we call it, Te Waiponamu and Rakiura. We call the South Island Te Waiponamu because of its supply of greenstone. Our tribal land area, the Māori term is Rohi, is the largest of any tribe in New Zealand. Within this area are some of New Zealand's largest national parks, and the majority of this land has been set aside for conservation, a concept which doesn't always sit comfortably with us, because in our legislation, conservation is closer to preservation. Preference flows to recreational and tourism users rather than our traditional uses, but more about that later. The founding document that paved the way for European settlement in New Zealand and shared governance of our country is the Treaty of Waitangi, signed on the 6th of February, 1840. Ngaitahu had its first contact with Pākehā, with European sealers and whalers, from around 1795. By the 1830s, Ngaitahu had built up a thriving industry, supplying whaling ships with provisions such as pigs, potatoes and wheat. Shore stations were established from 1835 under the authority of Ngaitahu Rangatira, Ngaitahu chiefs, chiefs. Many Ngaitahu women married whalers and the tribe was no stranger to European ways. Embracing the arrival of new technologies such as steel and iron for tools, the potato, whale boats, and most important of all, literacy. Such was the hunger for literacy that when the Education Act was passed in 1870, Literacy in English of that of the colonial population 
was sus said to stand at only 20%. While, Maos, while Māori literacy in Māori stood at 60%, it remains a remarkable statistic for that time. So when our chief signed the Treaty of Waitangi in 1840, it was seen as a convenient arrangement between equals. But things began to change. By 1849, the Crown began defaulting on the terms of a series of 10 major land purchases from Naitahu from 1844. A great fraud, fraud occurred when the Crown failed to set aside reserves. The reserves should have been at least 10% of the 34.5 million acres sold, and the quality of the land should have been equal to that set aside for the new settlers. There were also disputes over boundaries and the Crown's failure to establish schools and hospitals, as promised. In addition, the tribe lost its access to its mahingakai, or food gathering resources, and other sacred places, such as Udupa, our burial grounds. These breaches of good faith by the Crown robbed our people of the opportunity to participate in the growing New Zealand economy alongside the settlers. We became an impoverished and virtually landless tribe. The loss of access to Mahinga Kaid, our food gathering resources, even on the lands owned by the Crown, was as much a driver for the Naitahu claim as was the loss of our economic base. Naitahu made its first claim against the government or the Crown for breach of contract in 1849. Our full claim involves some 3.4 million acres of land lost, one-tenth of the Naitahu land purchased by the Crown. It took 150 years to settle our claim, but finally in 1998, there was an apology from the Crown, agreement on a suite of tribal redress items, and economic redress in the form of 170 million, plus the ability to purchase certain Crown properties. I am the signatory on behalf of my people to the Naitahu settlement. I will not in any forum ever argue that I believe that the Naitahu settlement was fair and just. In 1988, in the Waitangi Tribunal, an exercise was done and our government's treasury acknowledged that Naitahu had lost between 12 and $15 billion worth of assets. Our advisers, Credit Suisse First Boston, using exactly the same documentation as Treasury, argued that the loss was between 18 and 20 billion. First day of negotiations, so called. Our leader of the day, Ta Tipuni O'Regan, was told, the settlement is $170 million. Take it or leave it, there is no negotiation. Now in saying that, that I will never ever agree that our settlement was fair and just, I, alongside of 92.5% of Naitahu who voted, voted in favour of accepting. And we took a pragmatist approach. We could continue fighting forever and a day, or we could accept what we were offered and go forward and see how we could do. We finished last financial year at 809 million with 540 employees. So while I still say it is not fair and just, we are going forward. The settlement included a number of mechanisms aimed at ensuring that we would have opportunities to provide input to the management of a range of natural resources and areas, including areas within national parks as an expression of our traditional kaitiaki relationship with the environment. Some of those mechanisms have worked better than others. Within our settlement, what our settlement did not do was return to us any lands within our national parks. It did not give us joint management rights or access rights to any of our traditional resources found on those lands. To the extent there is a partnership between Naitahu and the Crown relating to our national parks, it is clear we are the junior partner. To date, we have received no preferential access to resources or indeed to tourism opportunities within national parks. As an earlier mover in the treaty settlement space, we face strong, some would say hostile opposition from the newly formed Department of Conservation as well as from conservation lobbyists and organisations. We were, however, still prepared to look for the positives. Our settlement included a commitment from the Crown set out in law to enter a new age of cooperation with Naitahu. 
In our view, it is this commitment that may yet provide the platform for continuing development and evolution in our involvement in the management of all our natural resources and the places that we and all New Zealanders treasure. Where are we now? I've provided a brief explanation of our iwi and where it has come from. Now I want to talk about what we have achieved, in other words, where are we now? Most iwi in New Zealand have now achieved settlements with the Crown over the numerous breaches of the Treaty of Waitangi since it was signed 173 years ago. For Ngaitahu, that 170 million we acquired, acquired as part of our settlement has enabled us to establish as a strong economic entity within the South Island, and it's my belief we're now the third biggest company in the South. We own tourism, seafood and property businesses, and in this way we can express some limited control over some parts of our environment. There have also been other gains in terms of involvement at a local management level for some natural resources. Legislative requirements for consultation and engagement and the devolving of sub-governance responsibilities to local people. But the question I wish to explore is whether any of these things have truly given effect to indigenous rights within the New Zealand National Park System. And let's start by looking at our relationship with the Crown. The Treaty of Waitangi re relationship between Māori and the Crown is not static. Representatives from both sides must continually work at it. It's like a marriage. When both partners have a meeting of the minds and work together, the relationship grows stronger. I can honestly say that the treaty partnership between Ngaitahu and the Crown is stronger today than it was at the time of our settlement. National parks are important to the psyche of all New Zealanders. In fact, the Crown holds over 3 million hectares of New Zealand's land mass in the form of 14 national parks. It is important to note that the majority of these national parks, nine of them, are within the Ngaitahu tribal area. This is land that, according to the Crown policies of the day, was not available for return to us as part of our settlement. The national parks within our tribal rohi contain spectacular mountain ranges, beautiful rivers, lakes and coastlands. They are all managed by the Department of Conservation, or DOC as it's colloquially known. These are areas of which all New Zealanders are rightfully proud and understandably fond. But to us, they are more than that. Mountains such as Auraki don't just bear the names of our tūpuna, our ancestors, they are our ancestors, according to our whakapapa, our genealogy and our legends. Every tribe and sub-tribe in New Zealand identifies by its references to its maunga, its mountains, its awa, its roto, moana, our lakes and our rivers. And the resources of our lakes and coastlands continue to sustain us in body and in spirit. These are concepts familiar to all indigenous peoples and ones that our friends and neighbours at home are increasingly, be increasingly becoming comfortable with. But how to truly recognise them and give them effect in the management of these taonga, these treasures, remains challenging in many cases, despite goodwill and genuine efforts on both sides. Since settlement, we are now asked our views on matters pertaining to those national parks in which we never had input before. But too often it remains the case that our partner still assumes their view is to, to be superior to ours and must take precedence over our views. In addition, the legislation governing national parks, which was passed many years before the treaty settlement process, tips the statutory scales against us having access to resources and from being true partners with the Crown. The roles and responsibilities of the Department of Conservation are outlined in the Conservation Act 1987. Section 4 of the Act says that those administering the Act must give effect to the principles of the Treaty of Waitangi. There is no other Act of Parliament in New Zealand that contains that particular clause. Despite years of discussion and a number of court cases in which the principles of the treaty have been enunciated, there remain differing views on the extent of these principles and many different views on how they should be interpreted in a practical sense. In one legal case known as the Whale Watch case, the court found that Ngaitahu's long-standing relationships to whales and our existing investment in a commercial whale watching venture was enough to create a reasonable preference in our favour when it comes to deciding whether to issue further permits. 
This has effectively protected that business from competition from that time until now. However, it remains the case that differences between our traditional conceptions of conservation and management of resources and the Western ethic of preservation enshrined in the Conservation Act and other legislation remain a stumbling block. We look at the natural world through the lens of kaitiakitanga, in which the people are part of the natural world, not separate from it. And preservation of our relationship with our treasures is just as important as preservation of those taonga for their intrinsic value. We cannot teach our grandchildren, our mokopuna, how to catch and preserve tuna, eels, and the traditions and legends surrounding them unless we are on a riverbank living those practices. And if there aren't enough tuna left for us to do that, or enough places where we can catch them because fishing is prohibited in national parks, we and the tuna both lose. This world view does not always sit comfortably with that, that of our treaty partner. Just recently we were told in the case of a marine reserve, the ocean equivalent of a national park, that the principles of, tre of the treaty needed to give way to preservation and protection of the area. The irony is that Naitahu is in partnership with the community in management of the surrounding area and has instituted conservation measures by replacing national non-commercial fishing allowances of up to 30 of some species of fish per person per day and up to 150 shellfish with local limits of three fish per day and 20 shellfish. No one could say that those aren't serious conservation measures but they are ones that allow us and our neighbours to maintain our relationships with the area and its resources. While we have supported marine reserves in other areas, in other contexts, we cannot accept that there is a need to turn one of our traditional food baskets into a kind of living maritime museum where fish are only to be looked at. I will be frank, when we negotiated our settlement, we aspired to reclaim ownership of large, large parts of what is referred to as the conservation estate. In particular, we sought ownership of our ancestral mountain Aorahi, even though the concept of owning the mountain we regard as an embodiment of our tūpuna is not an entirely comfortable one for us. This was a bridge too far for the politics of the 1990s. We settled for some capacity to influence management far below our aspirations. We do get the title to Aorahi, when we are ready to pick it up, but we only hold the title for one week, and then as to our settlement, we then gift the moan about back to the nation. The settlement provides, oh sorry, things are changing. I applaud the settlement agreement between the Crown and the North Island tribe of Tuhui last year as a demonstration of how attitudes have changed in less than 15 years. That settlement provides for the lands of Tuhui that were confiscated during the colonial wars and subsequently included into Uruwera National Park to be liberated in a legal sense. An Act of Parliament will recognise the lands to belong to neither the Crown nor the Iwi, but to be an entity in its own right. It will no longer be a national park under the existing legislation, it will have legislation of its own. Tuhoi and the Crown will partner in the management of those lands in a manner that is intended, intended to strengthen and maintain the connection between Tuhoi and Te Uruwera, preserve the indigenous e ecological systems, biodiversity, historical and cultural heritage of Te Uruwera, and provide for public use and employment of enjoyment of Uruwera and provide for a place as a place for learning and spiritual reflection and as an inspiration for all. As an aspirational statement of what our partnerships and the management of our special places ca can be, I believe that in itself should act as an inspiration for us all. That arrangement hasn't yet been written into law, but by the time it is, it has the potential to promote transformational changes to how all New Zealanders think about national parks. I sincerely hope it will challenge those aspects of the 1980 National Parks Act and 1987 Conservation Act, the 1953 Wildlife Act and the 1934 Native Plants Protection Act that have prevented Māori from being able to access and utilise traditional resources within conservation lands and national parks. Let me be clear, 
Naitahu remains optimistic. Changing those laws may be harder than changing the hearts and minds of New Zealanders. And once that is done, changing the laws will follow. If our partnership with the Crown is to mean anything, then the 1998 law that the, said the Crown was committed to entering a new age of cooperation with us will ultimately be the way forward. The new age didn't end in 1998, it only began. While the road is sometimes rocky, Tuhoi and the Crown significantly raised the bar on what real cooperation might look like. We are ready, willing and able to work with the Crown to meet the challenge of working out what the level of partnership might mean in our tribal region. But Naitahu, like our great South Island rugby teams, won't be satisfied with just meeting a standard set by our North Island cousins. We will seek to raise that bar yet again and to create a partnership that will provide the generations of Naitahu, generations of New Zealanders and generations of visitors to Te Waipounamu, the beautiful South Island of New Zealand. Tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā rakoutou katoa. Kia ora.